Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the pride of nations, the flagship of navies, and the class of warships that can influence countries even without being at war. I give you the aircraft carrier. In just one package that gives admirals and politicians alike dominance, the ability of controlling seas and skies that countries lacking aircraft carriers have just no hope of challenging. Even Star Wars technically has aircraft carriers. Truly, the aircraft carrier gives such an upper hand, it's like playing a game of Uno with only pickup cards in your deck. It has power unrivaled that... Oh, hold on a second. This just in... Aircraft carriers apparently are now redundant. Oh, 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 wait, wait, are they? Are they not? Oh, wait, wait, more information. No, aircraft carriers are back in. They're springing up any, everywhere. Why can't people make up their minds? Let's find out what's going on here. Keeping up with military events worldwide, you'll know that we're starting to reach uncharted waters. The world of today is a very confusing place, and this video is hopefully going to give you an idea about the possible roads ahead. Look, now, the world is starting to acknowledge the new Cold War, so governments can't really ignore the writing on the wall anymore, or as Captain Barbarossa would say, you best start believing in Cold Wars, Mrs. Turner. You're in one. Worldwide militaries are being reinvigorated as, alas, once again, East and West are starting to posture towards each other. So, well, major powers are beginning the mammoth task of overhauling their naval warfare capabilities. So, what's the next big disruptor that everyone's going to want to jump on? What brand of new techno mumbo jumbo are navies going to want in their arsenal? Well, it's cutting edge, yes, but brand new. Well, no, it's more like a remix, really. These craft were originally called Sea Control Ships, but their modern name, as dubbed by the United States, is Lightning Carriers. For most of the 21st century, the West, and in particular the United States, has enjoyed complete naval supremacy. However, countries that do not align with the West's ambitions have started to think outside of the box to get around their naval disadvantage. But we've been here before. If you rewind back to the years before World War II, the reasons the Germans got the hots for the U-boat is because they knew they couldn't compete with the large surface fleets of the US Navy, the French Navy, and Britain's Royal Navy. So the German thinking was to destroy enemy shipping from beneath targeting hulls. The Japanese, on the other hand, would place their faith in aircraft carriers, which were a relatively new ship class back then, but weren't really getting the credit they deserved by the navies of the time, who still worshipped the battleship. You see, the Germans and the Japanese had basically found out that the future of naval warfare wouldn't be about bodybuilder ships flexing their big guns. No. The Japanese realized that you can use aircraft to act as long-range artillery, but it's artillery that can score kills literally miles from its home fleet, thus making battleships pretty much useless. So, that's why the aircraft carrier class has gone on to be the main focus for navies. And as for the German U-boats, well, they proved that a hard, accurate hit on an enemy ship, no matter how big, is enough to sink it, or at least put it out of action. And keep that last point in the back of your head, because uh, that's foreshadowing. Oddly enough, the sea control ship class has been in service previously and seen combat before during World War II. Britain, in an attempt to avoid provoking a war with Nazi Germany and with America keeping an isolationist stance, hadn't stayed on top of keeping their military strong. Fat lot of good that did us, and let there be a lesson to any politician who sees this. Pre-wars and Cold Wars are bulking season, not cutting season, okay? Now this meant that both Britain and America were going into another mammoth war unprepared. The US and Royal Navies needed to beef up and they needed to beef up fast. Fortunately, the Kaiser Shipbuilding Company, an American company, was a manufacturing force to be reckoned with, quickly producing escort carriers at an unbelievable rate. These were small carriers, but they were basically designed to keep Britain in the war and give the US Navy more carriers in the Pacific Theater. So, you might be wondering how these carriers performed. And uh, not bad. 
is the answer. They did what they were built for. Britain was able to keep fighting, and the US Navy defeated the Imperial Japanese Navy. Due to the fact that the US had greater ship numbers, it allowed their commanders to split them up and embed them in smaller fleets that wouldn't normally have air support. Distributing their forces in this way meant more ground could be covered when searching for the Japanese. Before a battle, the escort carriers could be grouped together, creating a standard or large formation, therefore giving Allied commanders great flexibility when using their air power. There was also something about an escort carrier being sunk, and to be matter of fact about it, it wasn't a huge loss because the amount of planes they carried was only 27, a small number considering, and the ship itself could be replaced pretty quickly too. It took only 20 months to make an escort carrier, as opposed to the Japanese carriers, which took, wait for it, 25 years to manufacture. Hazard a guess over which side would put a fist through their wall when their carrier was sunk. Today, aircraft carriers are huge. So big that trying to navigate aboard one of them is described as wandering around in a maze. For example, Royal Navy sailors serving aboard the Queen Elizabeth class carrier refer to it as the Death Star. The USS Gerald R. Ford is the newest class of aircraft carrier in the US Navy, replacing the Enterprise class of carrier and will eventually replace the Nimitz class too. Both of which are already Titanic classes of aircraft carrier, so it's a real statement about just how impressive the Ford class is. And here, are a few stats. It was launched in October 2013 at a cost of a whopping $12.8 billion, and it's expected to cost a further $4.7 billion in research and development. And oh yes, it might already be obsolete, but really though, it has the latest brand new technology, a colossal hangar bay, and it's nuclear powered. The ship can hold an impressive 75 aircraft of six different types, which does make it very deadly. However, size matters for some, but not everyone in Congress. Some senators thought it was simply too big and costly, whilst former President Trump criticized the look of the USS Gerald Ford, saying, The islands, which is the command center of the ship, just doesn't look right. So do with that what you will. Regardless of its critics, the USS Gerald R. Ford is not only an impressive feat of military might, but also an engineering marvel. Sure, the design has supersized its aviation capacity, which is a big deal for aircraft carriers, basically more jets, more lethality. Created under the CBNX, now the CBN-21 program, the Gerald Ford was designed to be the future of US aircraft carriers. It comes with electromagnetic aircraft launch system and ordnance lifts to transport missiles, equipment and men straight to the flight deck, and it's got an array of sensors and self-defense systems. So, as great as carriers like the Ford are, the trouble is there are a significant number of new threats that could possibly be the reason why the carrier is obsolete. One of these modern threats is the cruise missile. Cruise missiles provide an extremely large threat to aircraft carriers, as they're very modular. Although not all the same, cruise missiles can be fired from ships, submarines, and land-based platforms, and jets. In other words, cruise missiles can come at you from anywhere. They're basically a missile that can be guided accurately at very high speeds, making them extremely hard to track and counter. Plus, if they make contact, it's gonna be a big boom. Modern-day peer adversaries of the West, such as Russia, have had a series of cruise missiles dedicated to anti-ship warfare in service since the days of the Soviet Union. The deadliest from Russia's military armory is the Caliber family. Family meaning there's multiple variants of it. Some versions have supersonic capabilities, which when engaging on its last journey before hitting the target causes defenses to struggle to react. The warhead carries 500 kilograms of high explosives or even potentially a thermonuclear warhead. Apparently just to make sure that the cruise missile damages something. As deadly as the these guided missiles are. They are not foolproof. Many cruise missiles have been intercepted in the current Russia-Ukraine war using cutting-edge anti-aircraft or AI missile systems provided by Western powers or even from man pads, which are portable shoulder-fired anti-aircraft weapons. No, no disrespect to man pads, just saying even the smallest AA weapon can save tons of lives taking out a cruise missile. So you might think that a whopping big aircraft carrier would be able to defend itself, right? Well, that's the question hanging in the balance, as China has come along and rocked the aircraft carrier a little bit. So what's China done? Well, they've invented the D-16 Donggang missile. Donggang translates into East Wind, and this Eastern Wind is nicknamed the Carrier Killer for destroying yachts. Naturally, they named it that just to throw us off. It's uh, apparently not a threat at all, only to yachts. <laughs> but no, they've explicitly said it's designed for taking out American aircraft carriers. <laughs> that being said, there is one nugget of hope behind this, as China expresses it's primarily a deterrent weapon, meaning its main role is to ward off potential enemies rather than actually fight. But there is curiosity around this statement, because we could interpret this as its bark being worse than its bite. After all, the Donang missile is a brand new weapon, so the fact it's not battle-tested may mean it's not as scary as it sounds. Anyone who follows military history or is a project manager knows that brand new products don't always get off to a good start. 
Nevertheless, it's probably better not to poke the dragon and find out. Hopefully the D-15 stays on the coasts of China, just uh, letting us know that it's there. Now, a big supposed disadvantage of the Dyne D-16 is that as far as we know, it can only be fired from the land-based 10 by 10 tail vehicle. Not to mention its short to medium range capabilities with its furthest reach stretching out to a thousand kilometers. Some would argue that carriers have multiple layers of defense, so it's just another gimmick, but no one ever built a missile solely based on killing carriers. Surely China would plan to get through a carrier's defenses if they were making such a missile. Major powers will have to take all of this into consideration. And, well, now it's time for lightning carriers to finally enter the picture. If you wanted to see what counts for a modern sea control carrier, you might get a little confused, as there's a few different names out there for sea control ships like escort ships, like carriers, harrier carriers, because they carry harrier jump jets. But don't get confused, they're all sea control ships, it's just the name that keeps updating. Now we're mainly going to focus on the US Lightning Carriers sea control ships, stay with me, as they are the newest and most cutting edge. They're also having the biggest impact on the world stage. So why are vessels going smaller, and where did the name first come from? Firstly, it's odd to go in that direction, the small direction, especially after creating the biggest actual aircraft carrier that the world has ever seen. And as for the name, well, that's just named after the jets the carriers will transport. The F-35 Lightning B will be the primary combat aircraft stationed on the Lightning carriers. They have been outfitted with heat-resistant decks to take the extreme heat of the exhausts of F-35s. The USS Tripoli, LHA-7, which stands for Lightning Helicopter Amphibious Assault Ship, just to throw another name in there, focuses on quick deployment for amphibious operations solely for the Pacific Theater and deploying Marines to combat zones quickly. And don't listen to its fake news name, it is still a sea control ship. The Department of Defense has also claimed that the Lightning Carriers will work alongside the larger carriers, complementing each other. This will allow US fleets to broaden what air groups they can take and what weaponry they can carry, giving the commander of the fleet more tactical options. And America isn't the only country using these sea control ship Lightning Carriers. There's also the Italian ship, the Cavour. Also, there's the new Japanese ship, the Izumo. Countries that haven't got there yet include South Korea, Australia, and Singapore, but plans have begun to adopt the sea control ship design. Even China is expressing interest in acquiring the same concept. In short, the sea control ship idea is getting a lot of traction worldwide. It's just that everyone calls them carriers, not sea control ships, just to apparently annoy us. Fun fact, the DoD is claiming Lightning Carriers can do more for a lot less money. To back up this claim, the USS Tripoli was estimated to cost $3.4 billion, but ended up costing the meal deal package of 3.3. What did they do with the extra $100 million? Well, who knows? It's uh, apparently chump change to the US government. The trouble is that this whole topic is still hotly debated, and as far as a conclusion goes, the jury's still out, but we can analyze what the thinking is behind taking on lightning carriers. Also, current events in the South China Sea give us a clue. There's no secret, it's a space of ocean that is a source of rising tension between nations. China has been turning islands and reefs into military bases. This has been rubbing Taiwan and the Philippines up the wrong way, and both of these countries have been requesting support from the United States. And that's where the clue lies, as the US Marine Corps has done away with their heavy M1 Abrams tanks and are now taking on more lightweight vehicles that specialize in anti-aircraft and anti-ship weaponry. Added to this, it appears that USMC is molding their tactics into island hopping. This could be a big explanation for the Lightning Carriers. Think about it, multiple carriers to spread out and attack numerous islands at once. As for the missile threat, this could be the sole reason why leading nations' navies are having a change about. I mean, think about how big and powerful an aircraft carrier is, all of which could be taken out with one large missile or torpedo. For submarine technology is advanced significantly as well. And that's just the carrier. Imagine losing 20 F-35s in one. Now, this is not to slate large carriers, but on their own, they're very vulnerable, even with the air groups aboard. But that's why carriers never travel alone. British carriers always travel with an air defense destroyer and an anti-submarine frigate, not to mention a number of logistical ships following alongside. Top-spec carriers like the USS Gerald Ford have their own defenses, like the Fallon CWIS, which can swat incoming ordnance from the sky. However, missile technology is evolving all the time. And to repeat what I said earlier, China has a carrier killer missile. In truth, it's difficult to gauge what the right answer is, and even if we could, it would probably be premature. To be frank, the new carriers and carrier counters haven't really been around long enough to make a big and insightful impact yet. Are aircraft carriers obsolete? Well, it seems countries are still investing in them and planning to make more of them. So clearly the aircraft carrier isn't going out of fashion just yet. But is the sea control ship design the future? We can say 
At a minimum, they will be around to stay and work with the larger carriers, but may not phase them out entirely. There are already new aircraft designs planned to replace the F-35 Lightning. And these new proposals are being made with the Lightning carrier in mind to work hand in glove. As for the modern deterrents to carriers, we won't know entirely how effective they are until those threats have been used. Hopefully that doesn't happen and we'll all just settle our issues over a cup of tea, but it doesn't seem very likely, does it?